again, thank you guys for coming. It would be mighty lonely without you. Do appreciate it. I'm reading from the New Living Translation, but I've read this in the King James about 100 times in the New American Standard, so English Standard Version, whatever you got. This is a very great passage, and I hope it's timely. I've been praying a lot about it, hoping this speaks to you and encourages you. So in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, it says, this is Paul talking to his uh, son in the faith, Timothy, saying, I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who someday will judge the living and the dead when he appears to set up his kingdom, Preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires. They will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry that God has given you. Last week, uh, one of my closing remarks was, if you back up um, for um, chapter 4 to the last verse of chapter 3, Last two verses. All scripture is inspired by God. It is useful to teach what is true, to make us realize what is wrong with our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong. It teaches us to do what's right. God use it, uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good thing. I would like to title this, if you don't mind, uh, just like a, a, a proviso here. This is not a guilt trip. Okay? Do you know what a guilt trip is? It's pretty much a religious trip. You know, when I stand here, and if I want to, want to teach or talk about spiritual disciplines, right, people automatically say, oh, what a guilt trip. Oh, that's somebody else could do that. I'm not so good with that. You know, and they take it hard, and they take it that way. That is not my intention. This is not a guilt trip. I repeat, this is not a guilt trip. We can all do better. Right? Anybody? Right? Yeah. Unless you guys have already achieved, then I'll just move on to another church, right? Mission accomplished. No. <laughs> we can all do better. And this is not a guilt trip. This fellow here is still working on stuff, and you are too. There's only one that lived that perfect life. You remember his name? There you go. I'm in the right building. This is good to know. So, well, you do believe in the Bible, right? You do believe, I mean, I'm in the right room, right? You do believe that this stuff is going to help us and instruct us and teach us. And sometimes, ouch, it'll step on your toes. Sometimes, like, yeah, I'm not so good at that part, right? I mean, so this is where we're at. It is not a guilt trip. So um, I was once working uh, on a deck. We were, uh, there's this volunteer group in Elwood City called the Carpenters Project. Anybody ever heard of it? I've worked with it for years. Did you work there too? Okay, I was a, I was a crew leader there for years. Uh, the COVID thing has got it all wiggly piggly. I don't even know if it's going to work this year. I'm trying. But uh, I was on a deck a couple years ago. We were staining and painting, and there was probably 15 to 20 teenagers there. And I thought, well, I got a captive audience. I'll take a little survey. You know, so I said, oh, you guys working here? You all go to different churches. You're all from the Elwood City area. What do you guys think, on a scale of 1 to 10, what do you think of the Bible? And just about every one of them said 9 or 10. Some of them said 9. <laughs> and some of them said 10. But one kid was so brave, he said, I don't know, Tom, I just, I've heard about the Bible, but why should I believe the Bible is true? And I thought, wow, I like this kid. He's got guts. What an excellent question, don't you think? I mean, so my next question, overall group, 15, 20 kids, I said, okay, you all mostly like the Bible. How's the church doing at teaching you the Bible between 1 and 10? Ooh, what do you think my numbers were on that one? Not very good. I got a few fives. 
I got a seven, barely an eight, but most of them were like very five and under. No kidding. Right? And I said, well, what is it about the Bible that you're, you're not getting or that's not... And uh, almost everyone on that deck who was staying that day said, it's boring. <sighs> Can you believe that? And I, I, I wonder about that. I said, I, I, um, I went to this place years ago. It was like a prison. I think they called it high school. Yeah, high school. It was like a prison. They forced you to go there. They made you stand in line. They made you learn stuff, you know. I mean, you had to. And then they graded you. They judged you, you know. And then, you know, they marched you to this thing where you stood in line, you got lunch, and then it, prison, right? I consider it prison. But, in, you know, from kindergarten to 12th grade, I can't you ever wanted to be there, pretty much. And one of the reasons that I did not like high school was it was incredibly boring, most of the teachers, not all, most of the teachers I had in high school didn't care about me <laughs> at all. They just wanted me to shut up and behave. And most of them acted like they didn't even care about what they were talking about. Here's the information, test Friday, moving on. And to me, that was just boring, boring, boring. But let me tell you something. In, that, in those 12, 13 years, kindergarten through 12, um, Every once in a while, there would be a teacher who, what, who would get through to me, who would touch me. Did you ever have that? Just one or two teachers, and, and they were usually gym teachers, <laughs> you know, or lunch ladies. But anyway, uh, I excelled in both of those. But uh, they just acted like they believed that what they were teaching was important. And you know what? That made so much of a difference. You know, I remember a history teacher I had in 7th or 8th grade. Now, pfft, see, I'm so fuzzy. It's been years. Uh, her name was Mrs. Bramer. If she's watching this, you did great. You inspired me. She made history so interesting. I wanted to be in Greece and in Rome. When she talked about it, it just gave light because she cared. She was genuinely interested in what she was talking about. And when she brought it, she brought it with passion. And it made all the difference in the world. And I had a... Uh, a really cool sixth grade teacher who was a musician. And when he wasn't teaching, he was out playing and making money. And his name was Mr. Hauk. And Mr. Hauk, if you're watching this, you did good. <laughs> and he just inspired me on every level. He could see something in me that there was an up and coming musician. And he actually was, you know, in spite of all my studies and my poor studies, he actually encouraged me to look into stuff. He made me think. I mean, learning stuff is one thing, but thinking, learning how to think and process things, I don't think high school ever really takes the time to really push that. And uh, I remember as I was, you know, looking back on this, teachers who really made me think, I, I, I remember uh, I was telling Sheila about this, my daughter, there were a couple experiments that I learned that I said, oh, I'll try this out on my daughter, she was just a kid. And uh, so it, it was just an experiment, an exercise, where you present them a problem, and you help them think through it, and they come to a solution, right? So I present this to Sheila, and she automatically got defensive, and she got up and says, you're just trying to trick me, and she ran out of the room. So uh, I wasn't so great at teaching how, how to think. <laughs> but uh, the whole point of this is, when, when you come at people with information, sometimes defenses go up. Sometimes they feel like it's a club. Like, let's get back to the Bible here. Most Bible teachers that I have stumbled upon, they really didn't have a great handle on the Bible teaching. They kind of did it. They were the last person, all right, I'll do it. And they go in the room and they, here's the scripture, here's the verses, have a nice Sunday, get out of here. You know, I just didn't see the passion. I didn't feel like this was important. You know, so when I was a kid, I knew zero about the Bible. There was a, a basket that we made in this one Sunday school class, and I probably went to three Sunday school classes in my entire you know, childhood because church was just like another prison. I didn't want to go there. They weren't speaking to anybody. But anyway, we were, we were knitting baskets. It wasn't the crazy house. It, honestly, it really was Sunday school. And on the bottom of the basket was a scripture, right? And so I'm knitting this basket, a very young boy, and I didn't understand. 
First of all, I couldn't make a basket very well. It looked like terrible. But on the bottom of the basket was a scripture that says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Right? Now, I'm a little boy growing up in the late 60s, early 70s. I don't speak Elizabethan English. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Well, if he's my shepherd, why don't I want him? And when I talked to the teacher, they went, I don't know, knit your basket and shut up. <laughs> so I didn't see or know anybody who actually loved the Bible so much that they made me want to love it and that they made me want to learn it. Do you see the difference there? The, the breakthrough point? Does anybody, anybody want to nod your head just once in a while at me? Anybody? One person, two people. Thank you. That, that makes me feel good. I appreciate it. it makes, I'm not boring you, right? Here's another thing. In, in high school, before I was a Christian, right, I used to think that all boring teachers were breaking the law and that they should line them all up and shoot every last one of them. Now, that was before I became a Christian. I have a little more mercy now. If you are a boring teacher, shame on you, but I will not shoot you. I will not have you shot. So make it interesting. Make it passionate. I know, God bless teachers, they're under the gun. They've been given this stuff. They've got to get it through. They've got to push the information through and move on. I understand that. I, 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 you know, I, I feel bad for them. But somewhere back in the early 1980s, uh, somebody gave me a Bible. And I wasn't much of a reader then because school poisoned my brain. You know, For me, a lot of kids did well. But I started reading the Bible, and I never really read before. And I loved it. I was just like soul food, the real soul food, you know. I just felt good when I read the Bible. And I didn't even know how to do that. Uh, I had a Gideon's Bible. It said, where to help, find help when. And I didn't understand the chapter verse thing, so I would just read the whole page. Page 340, whatever. And I, I didn't know the books of the Bible. I didn't know nothing. So I started reading the Bible with the help of the Gideons. And uh, I would just read the whole page just to be safe. And that's how I learned. And I just grew into it, and I liked it. And within a year or two, I found myself uh, teaching little itty-bitty Bible studies. And um, I had an old pastor who used to put me in charge of men's groups. And, and then I, I, I was in charge of a uh, drug addicts group. Yeah, but once the people got off drugs, I had no more group. Nobody to talk to anymore. So I was asked to uh, come here some years ago and... Uh, you know, head up a youth group, and uh, that really was a great time in my life. And, and pretty soon, they kicked me upstairs, and here I am. Can you believe this stuff? But I have grown in reading. I have, um, there's something, a, a switch in me that was on the off position for most of my life. I, I, I think God reached down and he flipped it on, and I, I really love teaching, and I hope that you love the way that I teach. I hope that you see in me that I really like the stuff I'm talking about. I hope I can somehow, God help me, make this exciting to you. I hope somehow that I can turn a switch on inside of you and make you interested. Because I've come to understand that everything written here is for our benefit. To help us grow. To help us with our rough edges. To help us learn not to do this and to do more of that, right? Not to give you a guilt trip. Not to beat you over the head and say, you could do better. You're not doing it. Straighten up. You know. We've had that. You know, we call them parents. <laughs> you know, there's, a, there's a good place for parents, and there is a time to correct. But my intention here, guys, is not to bring guilt on anyone. My intention is, hey, I'm a fellow sinner who came to Christ years ago. He is washing me up and cleaning me up, and I have made some improvements. If you don't believe me, ask my wife. Oh, she left. Oh, well. <laughs> ask my daughter. She's not here either. Okay. My son. Yes, you can ask my son. We're not going to ask my son-in-law. Still working on that relationship. My son-in-law, DJ, everyone. Oh, so you hear all that applause? <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Anyway. Just getting back to what Paul was teaching, this Timothy fella that he's addressing this letter that we read today, uh, he was a young pastor, but he was a little squeamish. He was younger, and he learned from the Apostle Paul, so he had a good education. So he had a lot to say, but he was timid, and he was like, uh, and Paul's like, come on, man, get out there, do it. And here's how you do it. Ready? I'm just going to go back to verse 1. Is she excited? 
Does she want to come to the head of the class? It's about time. All right. This is Paul talking to the young pastor named Timothy. I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Jesus Christ, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he appears to set up his kingdom. That's the caveat. This Jesus who we love, who we know died and buried and resurrected, arose to the dead. He is coming back someday and he will judge planet Earth. It, that in mind, here we go. You ready? You ready to put it in drive and move on? Do I see one head nodding? Two. Got it. I, I can work with two. Here's what he says. Preach the word of God. Can anybody say amen to that? Amen. We have an epidemic here in America. It's, it breaks my heart. We have an epidemic of boring Bible teachers or people who tell you four points in a poem and, and they teach you this, that, and the other and they don't preach the word of God. Too many. I'm not trying to be judgmental or harsh. I'm just telling you the reality. I took the survey on the deck. We were painting. I'm telling you the truth. This is an Elwood City fact of life. Not too many people are teaching the Bible with any kind of passion. There are some, but not too many. That's my observation. And that breaks my heart. But Timothy, here, you preach the Word of God and be prepared, whether the time is favorable or not. In season, out of season, the King James says. I love the way that's worded. Be prepared. That word prepared is a very sticky word because a lot of Americans don't like that word because prepared means be ready ahead of time. Most of us are like, what time is it? Oh, i got 10 minutes. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the American way. <laughs> right? If you're going to be in front of people with a microphone, hey, try to be prepared, man. Get in front of it a little bit. Do the research. Read it in a couple translations. Say your prayers. Do your stuff. So when you come, you're ready. A lot of us are behind the eight ball, pushing stuff, when we could be in front of it saying, come on back, come on back. You know how that works, right? Truck drivers out there. Be prepared, in season and out of season. Now here's, a, here's one that people don't like nowadays because nobody wants to be offensive. I don't want to hurt your feelings. I agree with all your sin. Bring all your sin here. We'll give you a microphone and, a, and you can have testimony time. And just, you know, but don't change because God loves you just the way they are. Sorry, the Bible never said that. The Bible says, come sinner, bring all your stuff. Come as you are. Come to this cross, but do not stay the way you are. Let's get you cleaned up. Let's get you discipled. Let's get the word of God in you. And let's watch that old self fall away. Like when, when Lazarus came out of the tomb, you remember what Jesus said? Loose him and let him go. Take those stanky grave clothes off of you and walk in your newness of life, your resurrection. You get that? That's our journey here in Christianity. None of us is perfect, but we are improving, aren't we? Thank you. The more the, more the Word of God we hear, the more grave clothes get picked off of us. That's the process. That's what being discipled is all about. It's, they didn't go out there with clubs and beat Lazarus over the head and say, you stink, you stink, take those rags off, you idiot. That's religion, man. That doesn't solve any problem, right? So let's, let's put our clubs, our religious clubs down, and let's say, come on, guys, let's get around this brother, and let's help him with this grave clothes situation. Let's help him, because we once were lost, but now we're found. We once were blind, but now we see. Let's disciple this young fella or this young lady and let's bring him in the family and talk about the Word of God and help them improve at the same time while we're improving. Do you get that? That making any sense? One or two head nods. All right, I'll proceed. Thank you. Patiently correct with the Word of God. Patiently. Ouch. Does anybody here like that word patient? Oh, I hate that word. That means you got to wait. You want something right now? You got your microwave, you got your instant this, you got your smartphone, boom, 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 you're right there. Oh, wait a minute. My internet's down. I got to wait. Oh, wait a minute. The phone don't work. I'm oh, the microwave, oh, it's exploded. What do I do? I got to go. I got to build a fire. I got to go catch that animal, take its skin off, and cook it over the fire. That takes a long time, man. I just want to go to the drive-thru and get a hamburger, right? I hate waiting. Is it just me? 
patiently correct people. Uh, not necessarily, guys. Well, I know how, this is how you feel. I know this is what you may have been led to believe. But let me sh- tell you what the Word of God says. You're judging me, Tom. You're loving. No, I'm trying to share the Bible with you. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Right? The Lord is instructing me, and I'm just passing it on, man. That's all I'm trying to do. Hate speech. <laughs> no, it's the opposite of hate speech, man. This is the word of life, right? So patiently correcting. Oh, here's one. You're not going to like it all. This is not going to fly. Rebuke. <laughs> Does any of your Bible say rebuke? When you have the word of God, sometimes you've got to rebuke. That means speak abruptly or harshly sometimes or with some manner of authority. Did Jesus himself ever do that? You know, love incarnated, God in the flesh. Did he ever rebuke someone? You know, he not only did that, his, one of his top 12, top three disciples, Peter, you are Christ, the Son of the living God. All right, Peter. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, man. That's it. Upon this will I build my church. This is amazing. But now i got to go to the cross and die. Oh, wait a minute, Jesus. No, I'm Peter. I'm going to straighten you out on this. What did Jesus say to Peter then? Get thee behind me, Satan. What? That's hate speech. That, that crushes. That, that injures people. No, we don't injure people. We just celebrate their sins, and we don't correct people. We don't talk harshly. We never raise our voices at people. Right? No. Jesus didn't hold back. Jesus knew if he did not go to that cross and suffer that painful death, that no human soul would ever be truly saved. Jesus was well aware that he had to endure that. Peter didn't know, right? So did he crush Peter? Did he ruin Peter? No, he corrected him. He did it quickly and abruptly, and he spoke to him. And there's been times when I've been spoken to, Tom, you idiot, no. And at the time, I was like, well, I'm so offended by this. But over time, I learned, hey, you know what? That person was right. They stopped me from making a terrible mistake. Thank you. Anybody here ever had a child? Any, or no, known a child? Anybody? Okay. The child, <laughs> playing with the ball, right? Oh, I love my ball. Oh, there goes my ball across the busy highway. Well, I'll just go out and get it, right? Do you have time to explain to your child the physics of, of cars in motion and human flesh hitting a moving vehicle? Do you have time for that? No. You say, Stop. That is a rebuke, my friends. Stop right there. Do not go out in that street. And if they even take a step in there, sometimes you've got to apply the Board of Education to the seat of learning, right? Is that hate speech? Is that hate? Is that a crime? (laughs) Maybe it's getting there. But it's biblical. Correct that child. Sometimes you've got to yell because you ain't got time to make your explanation. You get it? So rebuking, speaking abruptly or suddenly or harshly even to someone is a good thing in its place. Now, if I did it all the time, that would get mighty boring, and this church might empty out pretty fast, or else I'd be handed my pink slip and I'd be out the door. So i got to keep it in balance, right? We're not just a church of yelling, right? I saw one or two head butts on that. Okay, so head nods, not butts. Not yet. So, patiently correct, rebuke, and here's the one. Oh, thank God we finally get to a good one. Encourage. Now, that's one Oprah would love, right? All encouragement, all the time. Well, you're feeling blue, here's the keys to a car. Here's a million bucks for you. Here's a magazine subscription to you, yeah. Be happy all the time. Don't worry about your sins. Oh, just swallow all that. No, the Bible never teaches that. Sinner, come to the cross. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Let it in you. Let it do its surgery. Get those great clothes off of you. Change, transform, learn a new way of living. The old ways were the ways of death. The Bible teaches us, you might not like this, the wages of sin is death. People like to leave that part out. That's what the Bible says. But the gift of God is eternal life. Through who? Jesus. Right? So how do we encourage people? We don't encourage them to remain sinners. We don't encourage them to, hey, keep being an alcoholic. You're fun when you're that way. 
<laughs> I enjoy talking to you when you're half lit. Or when you're smoking the strange cigarettes. I like you then. No. That's not church. <laughs> yeah, I used to smoke those funny cigarettes. Yeah, I used to drink a little too much. I, yeah, but I stopped because I found a better way that doesn't give me the hangover. That doesn't get me woo, 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 pulled over in the middle of the night for being under the influence. Where are you coming from? I, get, I did get pulled over one night coming home from church. What happened to you? Well, I just came from church. Oh, really? I'm not kidding you. I'm not kidding you. You can ask Barb. That officer made me get out of the car and walk a straight line. That's part of my history. And I, I was able to do it forwards and backwards. The officer was so impressed. So then he asked me to say my alphabet so that uh, he, he could see if my speech was slurring. And it's just, this is just me bragging now, <laughs> my prideful days. Uh, at the time I was working in an office, my job for like weeks, I had to alphabetize stuff. So I learned like sections of categories of the alphabet. So I could literally for a brief time in my life say the alphabet backwards. And I'm not kidding you, I said my alphabet forwards and backwards without missing a letter. A sobriety test on the side of the road, on Newcastle Road, 1980, blah, blah, blah. How you like that, officer? I am not drunk. I am not high. I'm coming from church. <laughs> right? And he said, well, stop driving over the center line then. <laughs> so I got my rebuke. <laughs> anyway, the life of Tom, it, it goes on. Patiently correct, rebuke, encourage your people with good, sound teaching. How are you going to know what good teaching is? How are you going to know what sound teaching is? Do your homework. Ask your questions. Getting back to that uh, deck that we were staining and painting, the young fellow who said, why should I believe the Bible? You know, why should I? I mean, he didn't even give it on a, a scale of 1 to 10. Why should I even believe it? And he was a churchgoer who signed up for a church program. He's there staining a deck, and he didn't even believe in the Bible. I'm sure you, if you guys thought a little bit, you would know someone like that. You'd know of people who maybe have gone to church for years and years and have never even had that question answered. Why should I believe the Bible? Well, he just happened to be on a deck with a man who <clears throat> has a certificate of learning in bibliology. <laughs> the study of the Bible, how it came to be. Right? But enough of the Tom story. There were enough kids on that deck. They jumped on him. They started all at once talking to him about why he should believe the Bible. I didn't have to say a word. That was so cool. I was so proud of those kids. Isn't that amazing? But, uh, you know, you ask yourself, why do I believe in, why, what's the difference between the Bible and the Quran and all these other, you know, that's worth studying. It's worth looking into. And in this age of information, it, it doesn't take much time. Once you get over that lazy factor, you can do your research, man. You can ask your questions. And, and once you're informed, once you've gone through these things and you've talked to a few other people who you trust and worked it out, when the kids come along and say, why should I believe the Bible? You are what they call prepared to give him an answer. You are then prepared to you know, talk about your faith, share your faith. And uh, you know, just a heads up, some of you guys, uh, these uh, young fellas and some ladies, uh, our friends, the Jehovah Witnesses, they're going to be out and about here, if not this week, next week. They'll be knocking on your door wanting to share the kingdom of God with you. And there's a couple ways of handling that. You don't need to get in a long conversation with them. But uh, I don't argue with them anymore. I used to. I've been there. <laughs> but what I do now, my uh, strategy, from Bugs Bunny, strategy for uh, talking to the Jehovah Witnesses is, I love you guys. You're great. You're so brave. You come out of your houses and you, you knock on people's doors and you go and you're trying to tell them about God. Thank you. That's awesome. Amazing. The only problem is the Watchtower Bible Tract Society is corrupt. They have a history of false prophecies. They're mean to people. They cover over uh, terrible crimes that have happened under the reach. They won't ever admit it. But you could research it right now. When you go home, you could find it on your Google machine and, and, and all the things, the crimes. The Watchtower Bible Tract Society is corrupt. They misquote the Bible. They misrepresent Jesus. And you should see their faces when I tell them this stuff. We didn't, we, we didn't want to talk about that stuff. 
we just, we're programmed. They're, they are trained how to, how to argue, but not that one. So take my advice. Throw that one in their face and watch their eyes get big. <laughs> and watch them dismiss themselves quickly. Or you could take the easy route and just not open your door when they knock. A little encouragement there. Verse 3. For a time is coming... Uh, see, uh, let me know if this, this is happening in your world. A time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound, wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them what their itching ears want to hear. They only want to hear what they want to hear. Know anybody like that? Lots of so-called Bible teachers, so-called preachers out there ready to itch your itching ears. Tell you whatever you want. Just keep those dollars and cents rolling in. Got my name and lights up here. It's all good. Send a few more hundred bucks. Keep me on the air. Yeah, keep it coming. I'll tell you whatever you want to hear. You're all good. Oh, you're all little honeys. Oh, God loves you just the way you are. Don't change. Don't change. Come on. The Bible never tells you that. Get that guy's name out of the lights and put Jesus up there. That's what I say. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus died for sinners. Paul said, of whom I'm chief, but he never met me. I'd say I'm the chief. God hates sin. Sin separates you from God. Sin separates you. Sin could send you to hell. Yes, there is a real place called hell. Oh no, Tom, we don't talk about hell. It's a real place. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. And when we got proud and rebellious and arrogant and disobedient, we sold our souls, we sold our birthright, we went to the dark side, however you, however you want to say it, and we're on our way to hell unless we find ourselves a Savior who moved heaven and earth, who became flesh, who lived among us, tempted in every way, fulfilled the law in every way, took the beating that you deserved, suffered the death that I deserved, and while he hung there in excruciating pain, he said, forgive them. I'm included in that. They know not what they do. That's our story. That's our good news. That's our testimony. It's not about me, guys. It's about him. I love him so much. He gave me a second chance, and then after that he gave me a third chance and a fourth chance. He's so good. He loves you, sinner. Come, come. Join his hand. He, he, he paid such an awesome price for you. If people could get that side of Jesus, I think they would come to him a lot quicker if we had teachers who were willing to talk about that stuff. You don't have to go to hell, but if you do go to hell, you have to walk over Jesus' dead body. Well, dead and resurrected body. To get there. Why would a loving God send people to hell? He died to save you from hell. What are you talking about? Loving God. Your loving God is hanging on a cross praying for you, sinner. That is the gospel. You do not have to be separated from God. The drug addiction, the, the pornography, all the evil things you can get into will enslave you and tear you apart and kill you. That's sin. And after it's done killing your body, it kills your soul for eternity in hell. Jesus came to pay that entire price to take you out of that. He Two nail scarred hands, he stretches out to a lost and dying world that doesn't want to hear the truth. Once their ears itched, he don't care. He's still holding those hands out. Now a day will come when that grace will be moved on and judgment begins. People don't like to talk about that either. That's coming too. The full counsel of God said, yes, there is a sin, but yes, there is a Savior. Yes, there is a hell, but there is a heaven to gain. Jesus is right in the middle of that. He is the way, the truth, and life. He is your way. You bring him your sins and he will change you and transform you. That's the word of God. That's not Tom Milnes' opinion. It was here before me. It'll be here after me. You've heard me say that. So I think I'm talking to a room full of believers, right? But there are people out there watching, and this is uh, really getting some traffic out there. People are starting to watch this stuff. People are getting curious. People are getting hungry because the world's going nuts. They don't know where to turn. Here we are, friends, light of the world. We can turn on a light in somebody's world. We could say, well, I don't know. I once was lost, but now I'm found. That's all you need. You start right there. Well, uh, we could go to church next Sunday. 
Oh, I know a guy, maybe we could sit down and ask him a few questions. I mean, if you don't feel like discussing it. Uh, there's all kinds of things you could do. Shine. This is our moment. Because, boy, do we shine brighter in the darkness. Whew. It's about our time to get ready. And let's get ready with the Word of God. Let's prepare ourselves. you got a bald-headed guy right here in the preacher who's going to tell you the truth the best he can every Sunday and every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock in the basement. <clears throat> if you're interested. And you can come too. Uh, would you please come up? We're going to celebrate communion. And I have said celebrate. Does everyone have their elements that we're calling them? If you guys could help out, I'd appreciate it. We do this in honor of Jesus. This is called communion. It started at a feast, a Jewish feast called Passover. When the death angel passed over every household that had the blood of the lamb on it. And if the blood of the lamb has been applied to your life, you've been forgiven and death will pass you over because of Jesus. And we celebrate the night he was betrayed by taking this, what we've come to know as communion. So please bow your heads. We got everybody, sir? Okay. Please bow your heads and uh, get your elements ready. Let's pray. Father, we come before you, Lord. For we know, we are told in the scriptures, that on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he passed it around the table and says, this is my body broken for you. Take this and eat ye all of it and do it in remembrance of me. So go ahead and, and take that bread in worship to the Lord. And the scriptures tell us that in the same manner he raised the cup. He said, this is now the blood of the New Testament. This is the blood of our covenant. This is my blood shed for you. Take ye and drink it, all of it. And as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. So please take that cup now and do it in honor and in worship to the Lord. Now please bow your head and close your eyes and don't talk to the person next to you. Concentrate solely on God right now for a moment. Father, I pray for everybody in this room. Lord, there's people in here with family that are sick. Uh, there's a young man, Kenny, I believe, who is battling cancer. Lord, be with him and help him, Lord, and strengthen him and his family. And deal with this cancer, Lord, by your nail-scarred hand and heal this young man. And there's lost people out there. We have friends and family who are lost and confused and hurting. Lord, we speak to our friends and our family today in the name of Jesus. Heal them and bring them to the light, especially around this Easter time. Let them be moved upon by your Holy Spirit. And may they be saved and set free. And, and we will do our level best, Lord, to remove the grave clothes from them and help them be discipled. Lord, for the lost, the hurting, the sick, we pray your liberty, your healing, and your salvation. And Lord, for everybody in this room sitting here today, this morning, if they're confused in any way, if they're, they're lost in any way, Lord, I ask you to touch them where they sit, to give them the answers they seek, to give them the word in season, that can help them and heal them from the inside out, Lord. I pray this for us, Lord. And we pray for our country, America, that you would expose the lies, that you would bring the truth out, Lord, and that your truth would set people free. That we could have a land where we can raise our children and our grandchildren and be safe and happy and prosperous. Lord, I know that's a tall order. I know that's a big question. That's a big ask. But you can do all things. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. So our hope and our prayers are in the risen Christ this morning. For our families, for our nation, our country, our state, our communities, Lord. We will ever, ever trust in you.